So hello, 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 guys. Today we have with us Mr. Domagai Domagai Ostanchan. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was very good. Well done. Uh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's the Croatian national team actually. We start we have to pronounce it with Domagai Vidalia, the defender. Uh, so he's a podcast host for Johan Zrondos, a sports journalist, a scout, and an opposition analyst. He's a very he's very astute tactically, and as we've seen, he has combined all of his skills above. to write his new book anatomy of a genius leo messi's tactical evolution at fc barcelona so first of all congrats on writing that book man uh, so first of all i'd like to ask you how did you get the idea of writing that book and what research did you have to go through well well i, I always wanted to write a book right it was it was a long lasting dream of mine but i never knew what exactly i could write about but then again i somehow got into football tactics a couple of years it was four or five years ago and as i was always i i've always been a barca fan since i was a child it's been more than 20 years now and messi being such a prominent part of barcelona i i thought that what better thing to do than write a book on tactics on messi and barca it kind of all fit together and it's kind of a a combination of all the things that i love to do it's uh it's writing it's tactics and then it's barcelona and messi So I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to put together all the things that I like, like and love and love to do and love love to watch and analyze. So that's how how I got the idea of doing a Messi book. And then there was the thing of people always kind of blaming Messi, well blaming Messi for staying at Barca his all, almost whole career, and mm-hmm. bla- and saying that he was a one man system, that he was a well, one system player, and and that was he was. that he couldn't adapt to other systems and that he always had to uh they always forced other coaches to kind of adapt to him and I wanted to personally rectify that and, and tell people explain to people how Messi indeed had to change that he had to adapt that he had to develop his profile to be able to better serve the 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 whole team and and to improve Barcelona Also, do you think uh, over the times you were, he had to play different roles for Barca and Argentina? So that theory of Messi sticking to what he does only is wrong. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question? I didn't really get it. Uh, yeah. So, do you think that uh, the theory that Messi only lets the coach do all the work and doesn't isn't uh, you know doesn't change himself much is that theory wrong? Because he also disproved that in Argentina. Do you think he had different? Well, roles? I. Th- Mm. Oh yeah, definitely. Think that he had different roles. Uh, if you look at the 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 teams that he has to play had to play for, so it's it's all been Barcelona in the past, of course. But all those different Barcelona teams, they were they were they were drastically different. If you look at the Ernesto Valverde's Barcelona, if you look at Frank Rijkaard's Barcelona, or even Lucho's Barcelona, or Pep Barcelona, or Xavi's Barcelona for that matter, he's not playing there now. But they're all different types of 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 teams there. they do have the same fundamental systems and tactics they all they're all laid on the same foundation of 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 positional play however they have drastic differences because all those coaches had to adapt to to having different teams to have different pro- pro- profiles of players and also having a different type of messi in the team and messi himself always evolved in a way to elevate the team so if the team needed a playmaker he had to become one if the team needed a lethal striker who just bags lots of goals he was the one to develop that certain trait of his and it was also depending on the teammates that he had around himself when he had neymar and suarez for example he was he was more than willing to take a step back and let neymar and let suarez take the lead uh let them score goals he was more than willing to go back from the false nine position for example back to the right wing so that luis suarez could go back in the middle and be the number 9 of the team he was always ready to kind of sometimes even sacrifice his own uh, output let's put it that way he was he was ready to do that so that other people can shine as well and people keep saying well messi without xavi and iniesta he's nothing but well without xavi and iniesta messi was the one who had to adapt and kind of become the playmaker of the team So I feel like it's very harsh to say that that, that that he never had to change. And for Argentina it, it was also very difficult because they never really had all the years with Messi in, in, in the national team they never really had a coach who could get the best out of them. Uh so that th- they what they did was mostly just they Messi was the only solution for their all, all their problems which is also kind of an issue with Barcelona in, in, in the last years of his career at Barca it was mostly just pass the ball to Messi and see what he does with the ball. uh but 
but yes, I think that he always had to adapt. That's also a sort of adaptation because he didn't really have a teammate, so he had to do it all himself. That's also a part of that is, is the fault of the board, not so much of the coaches, but because they, they're, the, the, they're the ones who kind of dictate who gets purchased, who gets sold. And if you don't give Messi the, the right people around him, of course, he has to assume bigger responsibility, get bigger roles for himself. Uh, also, I think in 2019, Messi did prove well enough that, you know, he can do well without any and Xavi also. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's kind of big myth. Can Messi do well without certain players? Of course he can. That's the greatest thing about Messi is that he will adapt and he will kind of, he will develop certain traits and he will uh, he will emphasize certain traits of his profile more or less depending on what the team needs. So if the team needs someone who will just score goals and if the team has the creators, of course, of course, he doesn't have to be the main creator then. But if the team lacks creators, he will assume the role for himself. That's the big thing about Messi. Yes. Yeah, so I, was I, mean, are you, I think even in the current PSG team, I thought, honestly, mm -hmm. It's my fault to say so, but I thought Messi's dribbling days were done. But I mean, if you look at the PSG now, because he has to, because his job is to dribble and there is someone to finish all the time, he doesn't necessarily mm. have to take a shot. He, he can just pass the ball to Neymar or to Mbappe and they can focus yeah. on the shooting. Ball. Yes, exactly. So that's, if you surround Messi with the right profiles, that, that's the thing with Messi is that he's always been the type of player who, who can be the best player on the pitch the best player in the team without scoring the goal, without even assisting the goals. He can do things that set, set actions in motion. He can, he can be the one who will orchestrate things from the deep, for example. He doesn't have to have the final touch, but you can still feel his impact on the game. And that's one of the big things about Messi that other players may not, not all of them have. Uh, some, some players need to score goals. Some players need to assist. Some players need to, need to have a direct contribution to 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 the scoreline to be able to be felt in the game Messi is different he doesn't have to do that yeah also which other players do you think belong to this profile I think Maradona maybe and Neymar mm. are a few of the players who belong to this profile yeah so that will be very complete players we don't have really a lot of complete elite attackers or forwards I would say that yes Maradona was very similar back in the day uh, so that comparison is is very much fun on, on, on good foundation. And I feel like Maradona was even more aesthetically pleasing when he was dribbling to some people, I would say. Um, uh, and Neymar is, well, he had, he had always had the potential to be uh, a, a player of Messi's caliber. And I think on his day when his head is fully in it, I think, I still think that Neymar is, is one of the world's best. We'll see how Mbappe turns out. He, he has immense potential. He's one of the, the very best, uh, that the players that had the highest ceiling at the moment, but I don't think that we have many players of of Messi's caliber in a sense that they have such elite goal scoring and such elite creative numbers. So we'll see. Maybe maybe someone manages to replicate that. But the thing, that's the thing with Messi. Even if someone gets better numbers than Messi over the years of the in the, in the, near, in the near future, it just doesn't really matter that much. Of course, it will be a huge achievement for, for whoever that is. But the thing with Messi is, that, as we already said. He doesn't really, the numbers don't really always do him the justice because you have to watch him and you have to feel the impact that he has without it actually yes. looking at the numbers. Yeah. Also, uh, since you mentioned Mbappe, I really thought mm. of an important question and it's that do you think modern football curtails players from, uh, you know, having the freedom? Like Messi is accused, not accused, but Messi is said to have the greatest freedom on the pitch to do whatever he wants and he actually, you know, uses that freedom to great use. But uh, mm. do you feel that modern football is a bit more rigid and will not allow for Messi's in the future? I, I think so. I think there is a, it's, it's, it's a valid point. I think that nowadays, especially when you watch the players like, well, the players, teams like Manchester City, for example, they, they have, Pep is the kind of coach, for example, who will, who wants control over every single detail of, the, of his team and he will map the positions and the movement of his of his players to the, the very last detail. The thing is, he also he's also the coach who said that his job is to get his team to the final third. He will organize he will orchestrate everything, the build-up play, he will map the positions, he will he will tell them what kind of movement to do to 
get the best out of the, the opposition team based on what kind of system they deploy. He will find the gaps in their structure. But once they get to the final third, once they get to the close to the goal, it's up to the players' own creativity, own talent to find solutions and score goals. So in that sense, I feel like there are certain coaches that still, that still kind of encourage players to be creative. But the, at the same time, there, I, I do feel like in modern football it is much more, it is much more structured. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that too, that too. But also much more structured in a sense that everyone has a specific role and everyone sticks to that role but then then again you have certain players whose talent like Messi should not be limited into such a small box and and, and that's what that kind of talent flourishes the most and and Mbappe might be similar because how how can a certain coach tell Mbappe this is how I want you to score goals because <laughs> Mbappe knows probably knows best for himself how he's going to do that what he's going to do how what his strengths are so I do agree to a certain extent, but I also feel like there are certain players who get, due to their own talent and their own, maybe even reputation by this point, they do get certain, um, they get a free pass at that. They have more freedom than, than the rest of the players, maybe. Uh, yeah, also now that you mentioned Pep, Pep was maybe, I think, a pivotal coach in Messi's career. Uh, mm-hmm. So can you just make give us a summary of how Messi's profile changed after Raikard to Pep and then to Tata Martino, then Dulcho, Enrique. And, uh, can you just mm-hmm. give us a summary of the, Messi's role in each of these, under each of these coaches? Right. right, yeah. Uh, well, it's a very interesting, interesting development because back in the academy, Messi was more of an enganche. He was the number 10 um, when he was younger. And then he, when he got promoted and, and he started off as a left winger, actually, that's a, that's a, a fact that not many are maybe familiar with. And then due to ha- Barca having someone like Ronaldinho on the left wing, Messi was forced, well, I say forced, he was he, he was swapped to the right wing. And that's what, on the right card, he was more of a, this mazy winger who would dribble a lot, but it wasn't really a prolific goal scorer or a creator at that point. He was just a disruptor. He was someone who could who you could rely on to, to uh, break defensive structures through his dribbling, through his creativity, to his unpredictability. And then after Rijkaard with Pep Guardiola, we all know that uh, that's the false nine years. That was the, the most effective Messi because he was closer to goal. He was, uh, and at that time with the false nine and the whole Pep's positional play, back then people didn't really know how to defend against that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was especially effective against the, the 4-4-2 system, which was kind of, everyone's go-to in, in, uh, in the defensive phase back then. It's still effective now, but back then everyone played a 4-4-2 much more often. And Messi was kind of, he was wreaking havoc because back then you had you had defenders who were always constantly man-marking, which means they were following their markers everywhere across the pitch. And when you have a Messi in a free roll in the false line, moving across the pitch, dropping deeper into midfield, that would always kind of drag the markers down and they would create space behind the behind their backs. And that was how, how Pep mostly exposed the defenses back then. And then after that, with with um, well, Tata Martino, it was that was a very, very difficult period. Well, first it was Tito for, for a while, but we know how, how things ended sadly with Tito. That could have been something truly special because I feel like Tito was he was in so many ways the perfect heir to Pep Guardiola, but sadly. He got taken away from us in a, in a very cruel manner. Uh, Tata Martino was, it was just a, a mismatch. I think that he wasn't the right man for the job. And we all know that. And under him, it's difficult to say what kind of a role Messi specifically played. At, that, at this point, uh, it was very much a transi- trans- transitional sorry, uh, season. And uh, this is the part I don't really cover in the book because I felt like it wasn't as prominent or maybe it didn't really deserve... Well, deserve is a, is a tough word, but maybe didn't deserve a whole chapter or, or even more than that. Uh, and then with Lucha, we know with the MSN, this was a much more transition focus, much faster, much more direct and vertical Barcelona. And Messi would get back to the right wing again yeah. to accommodate for, for Luis Suarez's arrival, who would then be the number nine down the middle. Uh, and when he first arrived, he was actually a winger because Messi was still a false nine and Suarez was actually deployed out wide often and in the oh, early stages was? of I didn't know yeah he was. 
yeah, in the, in, the, in the early stages of MSN, he was actually forced kind of out wide. And then Messi realized, oh, wait, okay, I'll have to sacrifice my full line position just to accommodate for Suarez. And then he went back to the right wing. But this was not a traditional right winger anymore. He was more of an inside forward or maybe a false winger who would always drift inside and, and position himself centrally, as we know now. And that's kind of the thing with Messi, that he remained in that role. Well, say for the rest of his career, basically, but it, with some, with more or less um, change. Sometimes he was more central, sometimes he was more wide, uh, but it was mostly a right winger who cuts inside onto his left foot and positions himself centrally between the lines or just behind the striker. Oh yeah, uh, really. Thanks for the summary. So one of uh, another important question which I had was that how do you think Messi's career trajectory would have been? If he were would have stayed at River or Boca or Newells, uh, let's say. Ah, uh, well, it, it's 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 very difficult for me to say. Uh, it definitely would have been different had he stayed in Argentina. I feel like that has to be said. The issue with the way they play football there is kind of the lack of consistency in, in, in a certain style. Argentina ranged from being extremely physical and robust. To being this fluid and flashy style, having this fluid and flashy style with dribbling and, and lots of shooting over the years. And it's difficult to say how that would have affected Messi. However, I feel like his talent is such that it would certainly find a way to flourish anywhere. But it would definitely adapt certain traits and certain characteristics of the style that was that would pre predominantly be used in his immediate environment. So I feel like the same happened with Barcelona, for example. I think the very complete player we see these days is the direct result of Leo's talent being molded in La Masia, for example, and, and under specific coaches who first saw things in him, others didn't see, and were then courageous or maybe just even capable enough to bring those things out. So one way or the other, I'm sure Leo, Leo would have found his way to Europe at some point because he is, his talent is just too big to be, to be. I mean, Boca and River and New World, those are all teams that are well-known but they're not as big as successful as the big European teams, maybe. So I think I feel like Messi's trajectory was always going to be Europe yeah. and, and the top five leagues and, and, and you know the Champions League and stuff like that. So I'm sure that he would have found his way to Europe at some point, but it's tough to say how different of a player he would have been at that point. He would have been a different player, but at the same time, I think that he is the smart and, and capable and complete player that he is today because partly because of Barcelona and the style of play that they have and the, and the, and the way they develop players in the academy. Yeah, and, you know, La Masia is such a, not only prestigious, but it's also high quality, you know, mm. cream of the crop academy. Yeah. So, for, I think Messi's talent never, you know, had any problem or a threat. What, what player do you feel was most important to Messi in each of his stages? As a winger, then as mm. a false nine, then right. maybe now. Oh, right. Um, in Barca and Argentina. Mm. Uh, well, definitely have to mention Ronaldinho as the very first mentor. We all know the relationship that they had, but it's it's kind of difficult to say because at the very beginning, yes, it was definitely Ronaldinho who kind of tutored and mentored Messi to become, well, to actually to just propel him in the right direction. But at, at the end of Ronaldinho's stint at Barcelona, that relationship was kind of, I don't want to say it was a toxic relationship, because they still had a great relationship, but the Ronaldinho's effect on the team, and especially his um, the way that he influenced Messi off the pitch, maybe was something that Barcelona didn't like. Because as we all know, Ronaldinho by the end of his career at Barca, he was more of a, a party goer. Yeah, yeah, party animal more than a football player. And at the club, they were like, "No, we we can't take that risk." Because they at that point they already saw that Messi was going to be the next big big thing at Barca. So they kind of kicked Deco and Ronaldinho out of the club. And those were two highly, highly influential figures on the pitch for Barca over the years. So to do, to do that for, for a youngster, just the youngster wouldn't get corrupted, quote unquote. That was a big thing to do. But I would still say that Ronaldinho played a huge part. And then uh, under Pep, I feel like under Pep, it was more of a cohesive unit that was kind of, it was, Pep's Barca was a machine. And because Pep, not only did he, did he change the personnel, he bought new players and, 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 and he kind of instilled this new style, but he changed everything. He changed the diet, 
He changed the rest rest period after games, before games. He changed the training re- regimen. He changed the free time. He changed everything. So I feel like Pep being this monumentally big and contr- control freak at Barcelona yeah. kind of helped Messi mold mold himself into the player that he was meant to become. Uh, on the pitch, it's difficult to say. He always had a great relationship with Xavi and Iniesta because I would even say Iniesta was the more influential one because Messi himself kept saying that he needed players like Iniesta next to himself because he had to know that there was some other player who he could pass the ball to, that, he, that the ball would be safe with that player. That player would be trustworthy, that he would be hugely important, and that he, he could do things with the ball that even Messi could do. And Iniesta was such a player. He was immensely talented, and he could do a lot of the things that kind of propelled the team. And so having Iniesta next to Messi and having him as a plan, well, not plan B, but having him as someone who can who can also do the things that Messi might, might, might actually do as well, apart from the goal scoring, of course, and stuff like that, closer to glo- the goal, it was huge for Messi. So I think I would say Iniesta. And then after that, with the MSN, of course, Neymar was a huge part, but I would say that Luis Suarez yeah. was even more, more important because he I'm was... Sorry, do you think more... Danny Alves was important? I think he was... Oh, really... yeah. He was very important. Yeah, yes, yeah, I would agree that his connection with Messi on the right side it was crucial. And the type of uh, player that uh, Daniel Alves is 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 the perfect profile to complement Messi. It was the perfect profile to complement Messi. Uh, so yes, I would agree. But I would still say Suarez because he was just he enabled Messi to do what he does. He was so elite in his movement. He was elite in his combination play, link up play, and then he could also score the goals. If Messi didn't score the goals, Suarez would better him. And then finally, I don't know. And in, in the last years of Messi at Barcelona, it, it's, it's difficult to say. It's very difficult to say. Uh, I I don't know who was the most important, but one of the players that I, I talked about. Alba, it, Alba might be the mm, yeah, yeah, definitely the diagonal balls, the, the the connection that they had. I think after Neymar left, I think yes, Jordi Alba definitely stepped up and he became Barca as one of Barca's greatest threats down the left flank. But the, the player that is kind of the unsung hero to a certain extent, I would say, and I talk about this in my book as well, is actually Ivan Rakitic. I, I, well, he's Croatian, so I kind of, I'm kind of biased here. It's kind of a, a yeah, I, I just want to mention it because he was, the, he was Messi's bodyguard. You know? He was the one who was sacrificed so that Messi could kind of do his thing. He would drift wide to the right side. He would cover the, the hole that Messi would kind of leave once he cuts inside centrally. And he did a lot of the dirty work so that Messi could do what he can do best. And not just Messi, but the whole MSN. Because look, in the MSN era, especially, the team had to do a lot of backtracking, dirty work, covering, and, and running. Just the MSN could do what they do best. So it was, it was still a, a big cohesive unit. As for the Argentina side, I I do apologize, but I don't really want to go into that that much because I'm not as familiar with Argentina. Um, I'm not sure who, it, who the most important players for him was, were uh, at Argentina, but definitely in the in the late, later stages, which is true for his, not just in Argentina, but overall for Messi, is to have people who will who will make runs and stretch the pitch. So Messi has targets to pick out in, in the forward line and com- to combine with in, in a certain pitch. Oh. Uh, so again, uh, so what is your question? Yeah, speaking of Argentina, my next question was Messi as a captain because that is again another topic highly debated. So what do you it think? Is. How did Messi evolve as a captain, and uh, where did he, you know, flourish? Where did he start? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's a yeah, as you said, it's a very controversial topic because people see Messi and they say, oh, well, he's not like a captain because he's soft spoken, he's shy, he's quiet, he doesn't shout, he doesn't really talk a lot. But especially if you look at Argentina, I don't think you have many captains across the globe, you know, in 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 the whole sport of football that have the same effect on on their teams as Messi has in Argentina, for example. Those players are literally ready to die for Messi on the pitch. And you can see the way they talk about Messi. When they won the Copa America, look at the moment the, 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 the final whistle is blown by the referee. They, they don't really celebrate that by themselves or with each other. They all rush to Messi. They left Messi. That they, they did it for him more than they did it for their country or for themselves. That's, to me, that's just 
ridiculous. It, you don't see that anywhere else in the world. And, and Messi is the definitely different, different type of captain. And we already know that because back in the day, being a captain was just shouting at people and telling them to get back in line and, and to defend set pieces and whatnot. Messi was never that kind of a captain. We know that. He was always a captain who leads by example. And I talked to so many people, both from inside the club, connected to the club, who would always say in training sessions, you wanted to impress Messi. And if Messi was not feeling it, he was not really that interested, let's say, in, in the training sessions, it would affect the rest of the team as well. But if he was the one who got into it, who was really hyped up, who was motivated, that would push the others to do the same thing. And that was, and they would also try their best to, to, to both impress him and impress the coach and do their best on the pitch. So I think that Messi is different when he, as a captain, but that doesn't make him any less effective and any less, less worse than, than other captains that we, that we traditionally, or players that we traditionally kind of connected the captain role. Associated with the captain, yeah. Uh, mm. Also, now that Messi is above 30, which he's 35 now, so what mm. do you think is the best help required by Messi to you know, be a completely fulfilled player. What help does he? Uh, he, well, I, I touched upon this a bit a bit earlier when I said that nowadays Messi needs he needs runners. He needs people who will who will attack space because he cannot. He needs people who will stretch the pitch because he cannot. He can, but if you use Messi to stretch the pitch and get him too wide and too deep. That doesn't really doesn't really get the best out of him because you need you need to have I, I in my book I, I predicted that Messi his final stages would wouldn't be as a midfielder because he doesn't really have the legs for for midfield midfielders usually need to run a lot they need to do a lot of dirty work and cover and and yes he, he has the creative creative base to be the midfielder he has the passing ability he has the IQ and the understanding of play to be a midfielder but I feel like it would still be a waste to, to have him too deep and to, to have him do the dirty work as opposed to having him closer to goal and having players who he can link up with higher up the pitch and players that he can create for on the pitch. Yeah. So players who will run, for example, this Barca nowadays, Xavi's Barca with some runners injected into the team and interiors or well, number eight midfielders who attacked space through the half spaces. So through their half spaces, go into the box, Messi would love that team because he would finally he would finally have options and targets to aim for in the box, to combine with around the box. And I feel like with, for example, with Fatih and even the Belay and Lewandowski, Lewandowski is similar to Suarez. Well, not the same, but he is the type of player that Messi would enjoy playing with, I feel like. Also, uh, speaking of current Barcelona, uh, do you think, uh, you, means, do you think, first of all, that Messi will complete a cycle by returning back to England, Chai, one. And the second question is, do you think Messi 2023 and what do you think Messi's future will be after the World Cup and whatever happens in it? Mm -hmm. Well, at first I thought it was very difficult to, to kind of think or even hope that Messi would return to Barcelona as a player. But recently I've come to kind of change... Well, I, I I go back and forth on this on this topic. I feel like I feel like Barca want to bring him back, but I'm not sure if 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 uh, if how possible that is. I think they, they would have financially they will have to still do a lot of things, sell players, reduce the wage bill, which is still far from ideal. The club is in a much healthier financial state now, but if they want to sign big players on top of Messi and sign a big right back or sign, I don't know, someone like uh, Bernardo or I don't know who else they want to sign, it would be very difficult because Messi would be free, yes, but what kind of a wage are we talking about here? Uh, so I, I feel like it's a possibility because obviously they, they're, they're really they're serious about that and some big journalists have already spoken about it. So I feel like there is truth to it. But I'm not sure if, he's, if that's going to happen. I, I think that it could happen. And a part of me would love to see it happen, would love to see him get the uh, recognition and, 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 and the, uh, the fairy tale ending at Barcelona and the standing ovation from the Camp Nou, whatnot. All of that, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm, but I'm, I, it's difficult to predict whether that's going to happen or not. And after the World Cup, I feel like that's where we're going to see that decision because now before that people say maybe in January we already see something but I don't think so I think Messi is 
fully focused on on the World Cup. That's where his head is. That's why he's playing so hyped up and motivated because he knows it's the World Cup year and he knows that this will more than likely be his final chance at, at, at the big thing. So we'll see. Messi post this summer after finalism, he's a different beast, isn't it? It's like he's mm. preparing for the World Cup while yes. he's using the season, the calendar, just to prep mm. for the World Cup. It almost seems like. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So my final question to you would be: uh, Have you ever what's the closest you've been to Messi? Have you ever spoken? Me- to yeah. Messi? No, I've not spoken to Messi personally. No. Uh, I've seen him at a camp, no? <laughs> I've seen him. Um, the closest I was to Messi was he was in the in the car. I was on the street and he was just exiting the camp, no, through the uh, the uh, the underground garage. And we were outside away for photos and autographs. He he did stop, but I couldn't get to him. Uh, it was there was too many people. He stopped the car and I saw him really close. He was like a couple of meters away from me in the car, but there was just so many people I couldn't get through. Uh, so I didn't get the autograph or anything. But with this book that I have now, I'm hoping that the book will reach Messi because I do have some contacts that are close to Messi who will try their best to do that. And fingers crossed, I, I, if, if that happens, that will, that will be the greatest uh, greatest thing to have happened to me in, in, in the industry so far. <laughs> Imagine if Messi mentions your book with a Diario Ole. Uh, oh, that would be the I, dream, right? I know, yeah, that would, be, that would be the dream. Yes, let's hope that happens. But we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. So anyway, those were the questions, guys. And uh, had a lot of fun talking to Damagoy. And I learned a lot about Leo. With, as if I hadn't studied him enough. I had studied him. But the talk with you certainly helped me to gain a lot more information. So thank you for that. Thank you. No worries. I enjoyed the talk as well. Yeah. Bye.